Good afternoon. All on behalf of the Mental Health Engagement and Recovery team, I'd like to welcome you all to this follow-up question and answer session with our panel of experts from our World Mental Health Day webinar. We'd really like to thank the panel for coming back today to answer these questions, which we didn't get to on the day. We'd also like to thank everyone who submitted questions and we really hope you enjoyed the discussion that comes out of these. I'd like you to hand you over to Michael Norton, who is going to facilitate the discussion now with our panel of experts. Thank you, Ashling. Uh, as Ashling has mentioned, my name is Michael Norton, and I am one of the National Engagement and Recovery Leads with the Office of Mental Health Engagement and Recovery. We might just do a quick round off, but before we do our round off, it's just to say that we have two panelists missing here today, and we'll follow up with them. I'll pass over now to Charles, who's going to introduce us. Hi, my name is Charles. I'm one of the engagement leads uh, working for the HSC, trying to make sure that the lived experience of people in the community is brought to the local mental health management teams in our, my area. Thank you, Charles. And now if I can introduce Virginia. Hi, I'm Virginia Moyles. I'm the peer educator with Gory Recovery College, and we offer recovery education in recovery from mental health issues. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. Uh, and now can I introduce Ali? Hi, my name is Ali Myrna. I'm the Area Director of Nursing for Dublin South Central Mental Health Services. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. And finally, but not least, can I introduce Martha? Hi, my name is Martha Clark. I'm a peer support worker and I've been employed in the HSC since 2017. Thank you so much, Martha. Uh, and now we're going to start off this question and answer session. Uh, during our webinar for World Mental Health Week, um, we asked you to send in questions to us um, so I could ask the panelists. Unfortunately, due to the, the amount of rich on the day, we were unable to meet or unable to ask all the questions that you've all sent in. So this is now an opportunity for us for your questions to be answered. So I'm going to start off with Marta Clark, if that's okay. And Marta, my first question for you is, what is your top tip for harnessing a person's lived experience? And how do you advise to max, what do you advise to maximize the benefit? Thanks, Michael. Um, that was a great question. And I think the answer is in the question. Um, when they say, what do you advise? To be honest, I would try not to advise. So um, non-directiveness would be a value of peer support. So really I would be of the mind that most of the answers are within the person themselves. Um, and you really want to harness their lived experience so they know best, they're the expert of their situation um, and just create opportunities for them to problem solve themselves. Um, if somebody asked me, for example, for advice, I might reflect on my own lived experience, but it's to not jump in with that um, advice giving sort of um, approach. So it can be quite liberating actually when somebody realizes that the answers are really intuitive um, and born of themselves. Thank you, Marta. Um, I found really interesting from what is that the, the answers for a person is within themselves. Um, and it's an idea that is unique to peer support. So thank you for sharing a little bit of that with us. Uh, my next question goes to Charles, if that's okay. And Charles, what is being asked here is, what are there engagement forms for CAMS? At the moment, um, the engagement forms around the country include uh, parents of, 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 of children who are using the CAM service. Um, my, the area I work in, Community Healthcare East, is unique in that it, it, it has the uh, Lucina CAM service. And indeed, there is a forum for supporters of kids using the CAMS uh, service in, in our area. But uh, as, as far as I know, it's the only one in the country. Um, there is a move 
uh, to try and have subsets and working groups within many forums uh, so that parents can um, support each other and air, of course, their unique experience and, and the issues that they, that they have as supporting somebody, you know, their child um, through mental health challenges. Perfect. And thank you, Charles, for that. And it's really interesting to hear that, you know, even though there is there is only one CAMS uh, engagement form in the country, uh, it's interesting that uh, engagement are looking into actually developing more CAMS uh, engagement forms in the country. So that's really interesting as well. Thank you, Charles. Um, my next question goes to Ali. And Ali, as you know, we, we, we are in tough times at the minute with COVID that came in for yourself is what do you see are the key challenges for the next 12 months? Hi Michael, yes uh, I think we're all challenged for the next 12 months but I think really for ourselves uh, the key challenge at the moment is the COVID pandemic. Um, it's just having such a, a, a dramatic and a far reaching effect, far longer than I thought it was going to be anyway. Uh, and the real struggle for us is trying to maintain, I suppose to get back to where we were back in March and trying to maintain our existing services and yet keep everyone safe and secure uh, in their environments. So, so I think the COVID pandemic is the, real, the biggest challenge we have. Thank you, Ali, on that. Uh, and it's interesting to hear. Well, I suppose it's interesting to hear as well that really the biggest challenge at the moment, and for the next 12 months even, is trying to maintain services while, whilst we're in the, the grips of a global pandemic. So thank you for that, Ali. Um, my next question is for Virginia, if that's okay. And uh, Virginia, uh, this question is uh, about in regards to the people who do not have access to technology or Zoom, um, how do you reach these people during COVID-19? Well, this is a real challenge, Michael. The, um, the HSC has provided some people who use services with phones that enable them to connect to our Zoom sessions. And we've supported those people to become familiar with Zoom through one-to-one -one tutorials and phone calls. But there are people who won't engage via Zoom, and this is an issue that we've not been able to overcome yet. Some people are really anxious about using um, technology and security and that kind of thing. So we do try and keep in touch with those people by phone calls, but that's the best we've been able to do so far. Thank you, Virginia. And it's really interesting to hear how, um, despite the fact that you might be able to physically see your audience, um, that you're still, and despite the fact that some of the audience might not be very good at technology, you're still trying to keep in contact with them the best way they, the best way you can to show that, yeah, we're still up and running, guys, and we can still do this, and we can still work together um, in partnership and in true co-production. Thank you, Virginia. Uh, my next question is for uh, Martha, if that's okay. And uh, Martha, I'm just wondering, um, what is the best way to introduce peer support into the services that you work within, especially if one is not currently set up? Thanks, Michael. Yeah, that's a, a super practical um, question. And that's why I want to try give it a practical answer from the best of my um, knowledge. But I guess I would see a massive role for uh, the National Office of Mental Health uh, Engagement and Recovery in terms of connecting people with peer support workers who are currently in the service and looking at what went well. So lots of things went well in terms of how I got orientated to the service. So I had kind of a buddy on my team um, I had frank and honest supervision where I could hash out how I apply the values of peer support, where my role was different, where it overlapped. So I guess my, my short answer would be that I would see a role for peer support workers that are currently working in the service um, to help with the implementation of peer support workers across the country.
Thank you for that, Martha. And it's definitely a, a good point to note that, yeah, we as an office in the Office of Mental Health Engagement and Recovery have a role, but also the peer support workers down on the ground have a role in its continuous implementation as well. Thank you, Martha. Um, I'm then going to uh, jump to Charles again, if you don't mind. And Charles, um, a little bit of a philosophical question for you there now. Um, this came in and it's asking, um, is it true that the change to community in mental health services is because Western society is more Eastern looking in its philosophy? I was really intrigued by this question um, and I've been mulling over it uh, in the last 10 days. I suppose, it, for, and I, I can speak only for myself, on this. Um, I think as a society, many of us are becoming more holistic in our approach. We're seeking a broader appreciation of all sorts of things that used to be considered a little bit black and white. Um, and of course, I'm saying this against the background of part of our society that's becoming increasingly polarized. And I think it would be inauthentic not to, not to acknowledge that all of the good work that we're doing as an inclusive society is against the background of some pretty troubling um, discrimination and polarization that's going on in our political world. And that's not my area of expertise, but I think we need to acknowledge the world we're living in. Um, in terms of whether the services themselves openly acknowledge that they're taking a, a more Eastern philosophical approach to how they design, deliver, um, and, and, and uh, evaluate what they're doing. Unfortunately, I see, no, I see no evidence that I know of for that. But I can say that a more open and holistic approach, a more person-centered approach, a more varied approach, um, is being advocated for right across our whole society, particularly in mental health services. I think in some ways, uh, mental health services are leading the way in public service delivery by talking about co-production, by talking about the value of lived experience and the, the variety of lived experiences that are valued. And I hope that just begins to answer such a beautifully broad question. And I'll leave it at that for the moment. Thank you, Charles. And, and I agree with you thoroughly. It's, it's a it's a really, really interesting question. It's very philosophical in nature as well. Um, and I suppose oh, you've kind of nailed it. Um, we can only speak from our own opinion through political things that are going on at the time. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's plenty food for thought uh, in philosophy and all that kind of stuff as well. So thanks, Charles, for that. I suppose, getting back to the practical elements of things, I suppose, I'm now going to pass over to Oli. Uh, and basically, Oli, um, um, from the training, uh, or from the uh, webinar, has asked, what are your thoughts on which aspects of our mental health service, uh, so what's your thoughts on which aspects of the mental health service do you think involvement of people with lived experience could make the greatest of impact? Okay, we seem to have lost communication with Ollie, but we'll continue on if that's okay. Um, so Virginia, I'm coming to you next. Um, and I suppose uh, it kind of leads on to your technology uh, question that we asked you earlier on. And it's, it's pretty much the second or third part of this question. Um, and this this uh, attendee uh, was saying that um, I find from other service users that the lack of knowledge of technology going forward due to the virus is an issue. Um, so basically, the first part of my question is, do you see this as an issue in your role as a peer educator in Galway Recovery College? And do some people, do some people not use Sorry, some people don't use Zoom smartphones. So do you find that as an issue as well? Well, yes, it is an issue for some people. It's, um, as we know, everybody is so different. And some people are using, we've had some people coming newly to the college through um, technology who have never been involved before because they couldn't get to the college. Um, and those people are finding it really, really useful. 
and a lot of our existing students are really enjoying it. Um, there are some people who would prefer to be um, face to face. And we're hoping at some point what we can do is um, what they call um, concurrent classes, which have both face to face and live streamed um, facets to them. But there are some people who don't want to get involved because more, I think, well, there's all kinds of reasons why people don't want to get involved, but um, some of it would be to do with anxiety and fear around the technology itself and the security of it. Others would be people don't feel comfortable on the screen. Um, and with some people, we've been able to support them to move out of their former comfort zone into feeling comfortable with technology. Um, but for other people, we still to achieve that. Am I answering your question there, Michael? I think you are, Virginia. You're kind of highlighting the fact that, yeah, it, it, you know, due to coronavirus, we had towards uh, different and new methods of actually uh, delivering uh, recovery education. Uh, and from that, you're kind of seeing that, yeah, there is an actual a massive benefit to it. There is some disadvantages, as you've mentioned in your first um, answer to, your, to the first part of that question. But there's m massive advantages as well, uh, whereas you're getting a, a, to a population that you normally would not be able to get to. So that's really important to highlight as well. Yeah. Thank you, Virginia. Cheers. Is there anything else you'd like to add to that, Virginia, before I move on? Um, I don't think so. Just that there are real benefits in um, the use of it for new people and the people who are coming. So more people are getting um, access to recovery education. I think those are the main benefits. Perfect. Thank you, Virginia. Uh, so, Ali, I know that you've, after coming back to us, so I'm going to ask you, Ali, if that's okay, the question that I asked already. Um, and this question was, uh, what what are your thoughts on what's your thoughts on which aspect of our health services uh, do you think the involvement of people with lived experience could make the greatest positive impact? Okay, Michael, thanks. Uh, sorry about that there earlier. Um, yeah, really good question. Um, yeah, I suppose I feel like purely coming from a staff point of view, uh, I would feel that the lived experience would help staff understand really what recovery is all about. I think sometimes we as staff and, and as an organisation, we, 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 not that we pay lip service to it, but I don't think we really get it sometimes. And I think, uh, and it's only by having someone with lived experience who's been through it all, who's able to move beyond the boundary of, you know, policies and procedures and, the way a structure and an organization works to, you know, to the real life experience, to, to, to how it matters, how it impacts on a person's life and their family's life. And I think, I think that's probably the, the greatest uh, impact it can have. Uh, certainly that's been my experience from listening to anyone when, they, when we've had, we've had service users and we've had families come in and they've talked to us about what they went through. And I found that has been the best experience for me uh, personally. So I think, for an organization and for um and as a, from a staffing point of view i think that's probably the best um the best use of somebody with lived experience thank you ali and it's 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 i think it's very pertinent what you're saying in regards to you know you as a staff member yourself have learned from the lived experience of other people and is in sharing that experience with people and showing that yeah there are there are dark holes in life but there's also ways of getting out of those holes and, and getting back into life um and, and really and and what you've demonstrated there is is really important as well because you've shown that you know the lit the value of the lit experience as a knowledge set you know, it really enhances the learned knowledge set as well from what I'm hearing from yourself as well. So that's really interesting to hear. Thank you, Ali. I'll ask, I'm gonna shuffle things around a little bit um, uh, and I'm gonna ask Charles um, if that's okay. So Charles, 
it kind of leads back on to our philosophical question but we're 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 not going to go so philosophical about it if that makes sense um, um and basically this person's asked does this new community approach uh basically the community approach uh you we discussed about in your last question uh does that signify the need for men for seeing mental health in terms of trauma no worries at all um Charles, sorry, it's probably my internet. Um, basically, this person has been asking, does this new community approach um, in dealing with mental health um, signify the need for seeing mental health in terms of a trauma-informed care? Um, I think they both work in parallel with each other. Um, I think there's, there's a shifting understanding that in many cases, not all, but in many cases, trauma can have a significant impact on somebody's mental health. And that if somebody's in crisis, it's always worth inquiring um, as to what, it, what has happened in a person's life. And is their crisis related to how that has impacted on them? Um, in parallel, I think we're starting to look at mental health in a more um, recovery focus and that recovery focus calls upon everybody to be responsible in a large part for their own mental health so if we want the mental health services to wrap around us and support us in our recovery then we have a responsibility to educate ourselves on our mental health to uh, ensure that we wherever possible have well informed and well supported supporters and carers around us for those times that we are in crisis um, and that we, we mind our mental health in the same way as we might mind our physical health uh, through good practice. And that, again, those good practices come through education and community support. Um, there is a concern that uh, the public mental health services are, are moving things out into the community too rapidly. And there is a concern that um, the community mightn't quite be ready for the level of personal responsibility um, that, that a fully recovery oriented service might mean. And in parallel with that concern, there's a concern that the services are not adapting to this new recovery approach by supporting people in making their own choices and having their own responsibility for their own mental health. So there's quite a lot going on in parallel. Um, so we're talking about a new relationship that will take quite some time to settle down. And I think we're at the beginning of a very interesting journey and I've absolutely no doubt that the journey is, at, is in the right direction. It's towards a person-centered individual model of me minding my mental health with the support of a really highly educated and well-resourced team, um, if that's what I need, or with the support of my community who get me because that's what I'm always going to need. And I suppose this whole community development and community resource um, and strengths-based approach uh, really will, will, will um, bring tremendous benefits to us. And again, this moves back into the philosophical conversation. I don't want to spend too long there, but it moves back into the philosophical conversation as to what a community needs. Um, and, you know, I think we do have to collectively have those discussions and, and perhaps develop a broader understanding that a them and us approach will not work, um, no matter what way we're looking at our society, that we actually need each other. Thank you. It really does go back into the philosophical debate again of where we are um, on our journey through mental health. Um, and it's interesting the way that, we, you know, we're, we're moving towards, um, I suppose, a service that use, moving away from a service that used to see people just as a medical term um, and more to seeing the person as a whole. Person. Uh, and that includes whatever traumas they may have in their life and so on and so forth. So it's really interesting um, how, you know, we are moving in that direction, but how each of the models can support the process as well. I might come back to you now, Martha, if that's okay. 
And uh, Marta, uh, I suppose this question um, is asking, what can the mental health engagement and recovery movement do to include client service users and families of clients in long-term residential care? Yeah, I think this is a really good question. And when I was employed in 2017, I was employed on a rehab and recovery team. So it would have been to serve people who were, um, yeah, who were in long-term residential care. And I did notice, and I know it's it's only anecdotal, but what I noticed um, when I came in was a lot of people were a little bit disconnected from their families. Um, and I did pause and think about that. Um, about why that might be, um, what could support engagement going forward, what could get families more involved. I guess I would have a vision of, of this conversation being had with people who are in long-term residential care, um, because some people may not want involvement with their families. But one thing that could support more opportunities, I think, would be the inclusion of family peer support workers in our service. And I know there are a number of uh, students training in DCU right now as family peer support workers. So I'm hoping that there will be opportunities for them to work side by side on multidisciplinary teams um, and try to get the most out of, out, of, out of relationships and try to reconnect people with their communities and with their families, with the people who support them um, in a kind of a bigger piece, kind of relating to what Charles has said that you know, we can do everything and try to be a wraparound service where we provide everything for everyone. But um, in some ways that can be maybe even disabling and maybe that's controversial to say, but, um, you know, you can kill someone with kindness and maybe families found it hard to, to eke out a role um, it, for people who are in long-term residential care. Um, so yeah, I, I have no like, uh, I have no absolute solution. But I, I think it is a conversation that needs to happen. And for that reason, it was a great question. Um, and maybe there is an opportunity for family peer support workers um, who have experience of having to support a loved one in long term residential care, that they would have a really valid um, input into that conversation. I hope that answers it from my perspective anyway. Thank you, Marissa, for to the whole uh, idea of supporting people who are in long-term residential care. Um, and I suppose what I really liked about what you said was, I suppose one of the things I've taken away was the word reconnect. Um, and it's, it's about you know, connecting, reconnecting the family, reconnecting with the community. Um, and I know in a, in a past life of mine as well, I was a peer support worker in a rehab and recovery service. And a lot of my work surrounded this idea of reconnection um, and um, you know, uh, kind of getting people back into the communities, getting people to, uh, or supporting people rather, to, to, to do the things they want to do for them. Martha, if it's okay, I might just ask you another question. Um, and I suppose, it, I've, uh, uh, and I'm just wondering what has been the most useful support you have received on your journey so far? Yeah, so um, I guess no surprises. I'm going to be pretty biased on this one, but peer support for me was absolute eye opener. Um, I started in an involvement centre in Carlo where I was told about it and somebody invited me to go in for a cup of tea and they didn't hold my hand but they kind of did hold my hand to bring me in the door because I would have been very shy and kind of withdrawn at that stage and in there I met a group of people who were just so open and um, there was a great sense of belonging and owning your story and being able to talk about your experiences openly and I developed relationships through that that were basically peer support without us formally saying we're doing peer support. It was just natural. Um, and when I was in hospital, it was all peer support with other people who happened to be in hospital too. Um, and I still I still consider myself as needing and um, maybe needing is the wrong word, as, as wanting to engage in peer support. And once a week I go to a kind of a support group called GROW um, and that's my peer support. That's what I do for myself. 
So yeah, I, I would say the one thing is peer support, just being heard, being understood, um, and feeling that sense of solidarity and connection has meant everything. Thank you, Marta. Uh, and uh, I agree, the, the power of peer support is amazing. Um, and whether that is informal peer support, like the like what you've received in the likes of the Involvement Centre or True Bro, or any of those uh, groups, or whether it's actually formalised peer support, that is a peer support worker. Um, you know, it's power that has on someone who has a lived experience of a mental health challenge is, is unbelievable. Um, and so hopefully we can see the peer support move rise and prosper as we go on through our years. Um, I'd like Virginia now, if that's okay. And Virginia, a uh, question is for you. Uh, and the question states, what in your opinion has been the most significant factors that service users or associates should or need to consider? I'm not sure I heard the end of the question. My no, apologies, you're, Virginia. You're going um, in and out. Yes, I apologize for that. I'm just going to read the question again, if that's okay. That's fine. So what, what, in your opinion, has been the most significant factors that service users or associates should or need to consider when becoming involved? Well, I'm not sure that people need to give it a huge amount of consideration before trying to get involved. Um, I thought about it and I thought, well, probably the most significant factor is the likely impact on their own recovery. But they may not um, be able to assess that before they get involved. And I thought that rather than spend an awful lot of time thinking about it if somebody tries it out and sees what happens and then you can always step out again you can always step away again but most people who get involved really get a lot of benefit from it and really like the involvement and find that it um, supports their recovery and I think the other significant factor that people would think about is the impact it might have on other people's recovery as well people often think they're getting involved for their own sake and don't necessarily think about how much impact it has on the people around them. So both of those are you, the impact it might have on your own recovery, how you might support other people, but don't think too hard about it. Try it out and come and join us, basically. I don't think you'll regret it. Thank you, Virginia, for that. And it is... Uh... Um, you're, you're dead spot on. Like, don't overthink it. Um, just, just jump in and, and see what, see what it's like for you. Uh, and the thing is, you might surprise yourself. You might not just support yourself in your own recovery, but support someone else in their own recovery as well. And that's an amazing gift to give people as well. Um, so thank you, Virginia. Um, I noticed Marta, you want to pop in here on this question. Is that correct? Yeah, I just want to echo what Virginia said so eloquently. Um, when I was talking about what helped me on my journey, I forgot to mention in a way, because it would sound maybe a bit big headed, but the idea that I had something to contribute and my presence offering something valuable Wow, like that was, that was, I thought I had nothing to offer. Um, and I think Virginia really expressed that really well. Just your presence as a listening ear, as somebody who can, who can just be themselves, never underestimate the impact that can have on someone else. So yeah, I just wanted to, to jump in there. Well, thank you for that, Martha, because it's a very important part of our discussion. Yeah, uh, you know, becoming involved can, can, can really be a life changer for people. So that's really interesting to hear as well. Um, Ali, I might come to you next if that's okay. And um, I have a question here um, and it says, the services are moving into the community and psychiatric hospitals are closing. Uh, is this fully wise? There is a tsunami of mental health struggles for people, for people coming due to COVID. I think you zoned out. 
I think I understand this question, Michael. Yeah, and um, certainly that I saw that question. I think it's a very good question, actually, and I could certainly hear their point of view. I think it's quite difficult, and it can be a bit of a struggle at the moment out there, particularly with the COVID pandemic at the moment as well. Um, I suppose from, from a service point of view, and actually even since right through my training, the approach, if you like, of the mental health services has been towards comprehensive community-based um, services and a move away from institutional care and from the paternalistic type of care that, that services are taught to give. And it was interested in what Charles said earlier, actually, and he was quite right, like, you know, that by moving people out to the community, are, are the communities ready for them and are they fully resourced? And that is an important factor, you know. Um, and I think in more recent times, particularly around, you know, our service being based on recovery folks, uh, principles and are we, are we ready for that yet like you know so however I suppose there's always going to be need for acute inpatient care because there's always going to be very unwell patients uh, not too many but they will be very unwell and they probably they can't be managed in the community uh, I think the issue around a lot of the the the, the units and maybe why that service was possibly closed down by uh, I think the questioner uh, said by the HICWA report or probably possibly a mental health commission report is generally because I think a lot of them are, are run down. Uh, they're not fit for purpose. Indeed, we have a few units in our area which are, are uh, which the Mental Health Commission, and rightly so, have a big problem with, because they're not spacious, they're not warm and inviting, and um, they should be the standard of a three or four star hotel, and, and they're certainly not, and they're not capable of minding a person's privacy or dignity. That's really really important. So I, I think it's to answer the question. I think it's really important to have good available responses out in the community like maybe, you know, access to getting urgent appointments, you know, looking at a crisis intervention service, maybe um, having acute day hospital services or a home care team, having alternatives to inpatient admission. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Ali, for that. Um, and it's really one of the messages that you're kind of hitting home is that, you know, um, people do better if they're treated at home and if they're treated in the community. And that's really, really important as well. Charles, I might come to you next if that's okay. Um, and Charles, I suppose uh, this question um, is, is to do with HSC volunteering. And uh, basically the person is asking, can you as a HSC volunteer opt into courses on HSC? Um. Mike, Michael, um, unfortunately, my video has been stopped, apparently by the host. Is that making sense? I have a note saying you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. That's OK, uh, uh, Charles. Just just keep answering the question. OK, no, I've got to start my video now. Here I am. It's probably just technical. So, so um, I don't know the answer to that. I know that in practice, it's possible for anyone with a connection to the HSE to access HSE land. And I'm not sure whether in theory it's allowed, but certainly in practice, it's doable. You can do it through any of the recovery colleges. They'll, they'll fix you up with access to HSE land to participate in any of the courses. Um, and it's just that I've never seen an official communication uh, encouraging me to spread the word about HSE land. Um, and uh, <laughs> we should follow up on that. Perfect. Thank you so much, Charles. Um, and yeah, uh, HSE land is a useful resource for people. So it might be worth a check out. Um, Absolutely. I'm going to go, I'm going to ask you one more question, Charles, if that's okay. Um, and I suppose um, this kind of statement came in from uh, from an attendee, and they just want you to to discuss this. And they said oversharing was a, a was a problem for me. Uh, I didn't know why forum why my forum and their sorry I didn't know my forum and therefore format. That's a skill that is needed for many in the mental health sector. So can you discuss what, what has been said there? Sure. Okay. Well, I think Martha has addressed part of this already on this discussion. And I totally support her idea that 
we shouldn't have the expertise in how people or what people should share. Our job as a community is to encourage openness and to support people to make their own decisions um, about disclosure um, and, and helping them, if you like, to, to see the value in it for themselves and also the huge value for others. I mean, when I hear other people's stories, um, it moves me, it educates me, it, it grows my soul a little bit. Um, on the other hand, um, and this is without wanting to sound in the slightest bit protective, there are some people who have felt that they have overshared um, in the past, um, you know, in, 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 in disclosing their story and have some regrets around this. And that's, that's something that's regrettable. And, you know, uh, my heart goes out to people who feel they've, they've gone too far. Um, and so this is a really difficult question to answer um, because we all have a concern and to a certain extent a care about each other, which is, which is perfectly human and very, very positive. And on the other hand, the work that we're doing is constantly promoting and celebrating personal responsibility and personal choice. So maybe the answer to all of this is around education, that people can see what appropriate sharing looks like um, and are encouraged to do so before they share too much themselves. And that might give them an idea of the scope and extent of what might be what might what might work for them. Um, and I have to say, from my own experience, that you know there were there were times when I was going through a crisis and and it was in in a pretty bad place, and I did say too much at times. And people uh, who who I disclosed to handled it really well, and I never felt any. Uh, raised eyebrows or any sense of opprobrium or, 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 or disrespect from them. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I recognize that I was, I was blathering on too much and I don't do that so much anymore about what I've been through and how I feel about it. But I'm certainly always willing to have a conversation around uh, and appropriately around my experience in that it might help other people. Um, and I'm always, as I said before, I, I, I'm honored and, and privileged to hear other people's stories. And I hope I've answered the question without going too far around it, but it's such a big question. And I, I'm not sure there's, there's a particularly uh, fixed answer you can give to it. I think, you know, Martha really, you know, tried to address it by saying, look, it's really up to you. Um, and I, I, I very much agree with that. Thank you so much, Charles. Um, and I believe Marta wanted to, to drop in there for a minute. Yeah, I guess I just wanted to respond um, or to elaborate a little bit more, I guess, on what I had said earlier. But I think, Charles, actually, you covered it. Um, I mean, as a peer support worker, I like to think that I create safe opportunities for people to disclose things. Um, and in a certain way, I've done a lot of work on my own personal narrative on how I tell my story so that it's empowering for me and empowering for the other person so like Charles said there is definitely a role for education there with recovery colleges and it can be a really liberating piece of work when you see your personal narrative and how it changes over time and you know what you reflect on down the road is different to what you might have yesterday and it is a skill to use your to use your lived experience in a way that's helpful to yourself obviously and helpful to the other person I think mm -hmm. if you're telling your story because you need maybe some some form of healing or some some uh sort of you're in maybe in crisis or something there are definitely you know safe places to do that um and it's important to to kind of signpost those places to people maybe they need to work on trauma maybe they need some sort of therapy session um uh maybe a one-on-one -on -one or maybe you know with people who have similar experiences but uh yeah it's it's definitely a dance it's there's definitely a bit of learning involved for everyone in this line of work um but it can be really powerful thank you martha uh and thank you charles as well for that interesting uh, discussion in regards to all this um and uh sorry now um if I can ask Martha another question, if that's okay. Um, so, Martha, um, has there been any studies done on the viability and cost of benefits 
of care workers to show the cost and uh, and to show the cost saved on the long term um, for of a recovery approach in Ireland. Yes, so that's a question I would have had before I went into this role because intuitively I would have said there is a there is a, a big value and you know um, that a cost benefit analysis would show that peer support um, was a worthy investment. So the. The HSC, I don't know if it was it through the HSC, but on lenus.ie, L-E-N-U-S.ie, you can find a guidance paper that was done 2016. Um, I think the author was Collins, and but if you put in peer support guidance paper, it will come up, and they uh, basically did a review of all the literature in preparation for the recruitment of peer support workers into the service, um, and it did show that there was a value. Um, and there was a, yeah, a lot of um, a lot of interest in research that was cited in it. So that's what I would I would direct somebody towards that piece of paper because it definitely opened my eyes and gave me a lot of confidence around what I was doing. Um, and I think we, we should be constantly reviewing it going forward. And I know the HSC is internally, but um, yeah, there 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 should be more and more research coming out by the day now that we're getting more and more established. So. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, uh, Martha, for that. And that that um, that guidance paper is a really interesting guidance paper to look at um, if you are um, interested in uh, looking into peer support. And also, the HSE Office of Mental Health Engagement and Recovery has a useful impact study on peer support workers, as well as a peer support worker toolkit to help you get started on that road to getting peer support workers. Virginia, I might ask you a question now, if that's okay. And uh, this question um, is linking back to recovery education once again, and COVID-19. I've lost you. Um, so this person is asking, has there been, can you hear me? I can. No, I can't now. Perfect. So, uh, I've lost you again. Can you hear me now? Yes, now I can. Okay. So has there been more of an uptake of people engaging in recovery education programs since the start of COVID? And if so, do what do you think has been the benefits? Well, um, I'd say there's a slightly greater uptake. Um, our numbers are up a bit, but not hugely. Um, some people have joined us. Some people have fallen away because of what I said earlier about not wanting to engage with technology. So um, again, it's pros and cons. The people who are coming to us are getting benefits of recovery education. And a lot of them probably much more um, familiarity with technology and more competence and confidence around it. So that's positive too. Um, so I suppose the benefits are that slightly more people would be engaging. Um, and I think that's not necessarily because of COVID, but because of there isn't any other way to engage in recovery education at the moment. So in the sense it's caused by COVID, but it's the lack of recovery education rather than the existence of the, the virus. Um, but there are drawbacks in that we've lost some people to you know, having to use technology that they're not comfortable with. Thank you, Virginia. And it's really interesting to hear that, yeah, there has been a slight uptick bit more of an uptake since the COVID-19 restrictions. And that might be to a many different reasons. Could be loneliness, could be isolation, could be could be a, a more now that we're in COVID-19 times. Um, I suppose I just want to ask you another question, Virginia, if that's all right. And this question states, is there much cooperation from GPs in directing clients to recovery colleges? And are they with the movement? Right. Um, it varies. 
Um, GPs are individuals like the rest of us. And we have had several um, students um, who've joined us after um, a suggestion from their GP that they um, come to us. Um, I'm not sure, we haven't been keeping um, a watch and brief over which GPs are making such suggestions. Um, we do try and keep GPs um, informed on what we're doing. And I think possibly we could up our game in that, in that area and maybe start thinking about who is um, spreading the word and who isn't. But as to whether they're with the movement, it varies. It's, um, some embrace it and some don't. Thank you, Virginia. And it shows how much work we've done already as recovery practitioners, but how much work is yet to go um, before we can get a service and before we can get everyone's buy-in into, into the recovery movement. Nice. Thank you so much, Virginia. Um, I'd like to call back Charles, if that's okay. Um, and Charles, I have one question for you. I would like to know if other fora have had difficulty with engagement with their local management team or committee. And if so, what suggestions have you for improving the interaction and communication between them? Wow, that's a big one. Um, I was saying earlier that there are um, some cultural challenges that this whole recovery movement may have for such a large and entrenched service. Um, and it's not to make it personal, um, though sometimes it's difficult, you know, when you're in the moment, not to feel, um, wow, you know, that, 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 that you, you can lose perspective. There's no doubt that um, management teams for mental health services don't always engage with their local forums and that can cause uh, frustration and um, a sense of being devalued or not wanted. Um, and I suppose even though engagement has been going on for about three years now, it's still very early days. Um, it will take time for some more traditional teams and more traditional team leaders on these management teams to see the value and the resource of the voice of the community who can reflect on how the service impacts them. I don't think any of us on these calls um, have, because I think I'm talking to the converted here, I don't think anybody on these calls has any doubt that the service would hugely benefit from uh, the common sense lived experience of people who use the services. Um, but sometimes um, the, 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 the teams haven't quite gotten around to that. And I think it's, it's the role of uh, the engagement leads right across the country uh, to work with those management teams and, and help them understand the benefits. Um, and without you know, going into too much detail, because it would be inappropriate, but some of those management teams have internal problems of their own. Um, and and that it's difficult for a team that's under pressure to welcome in, if you like, an outside perspective. Um, and that is, that is the crux of some of the difficulties that some forums are having in, in engaging with, with, with their teams. I think it, it's, going to, it's going to mellow out over time. Of course, as one of the engagement leads, I have a concern that people in the community will just get frustrated and, and say, look, this, this, this engagement thing isn't working in our area, and just march off. And that, that's a distinct possibility you know, um, that, that we face. But I'm also um, absolutely amazed at the calm persistence of people in our communities who really want this thing to happen and are prepared to put up with quite a lot to get there. Um, and, you know, I, I think there's, there's something really um, remarkable about how well people um, in communities have supported the whole idea of engagement. Um, because you can, you can see why it would be useful, but to, to actually persist um, well past the point of common sense in some cases 
it's it's tremendous and i do i do believe as an individual and obviously as somebody involved in, in engagement i do believe that it's going to pay off it's going to work but oh my god has it taken time and i think you know it would be it would be foolish of any of us to kind of gloss over that yeah, i think we have to acknowledge the difficulty uh, see the benefits and persist and i hope that doesn't sound too negative i i, I really want this to work and i think most of the people throughout our communities right across the country they also want it to work Thank you so much for that, Charles. Um, and it's 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 interesting um, the way that you know the engagement forums have got such a long have gone such a long way since they were since they were established in I think it was around 2016 they were established 2016 2017 um, and uh, uh, and go but we are getting there um, and it's true people like yourself who has a true passion for engagement and recovery um, that we that we will get there. Um, so thank you, Charles. Um, the next question um, is actually for myself, would you believe? Um, and the question information on trauma and foops mentioned earlier. So ironically, I, um, I am the chairperson of a trauma-informed working group that's looking into developing a guidance document uh, to, uh, to, I suppose, address trauma-informed issues within the health services uh, and how we can get our services to be more trauma-informed uh, and also how we can, um, and also to identify what training needs are needed for staff who want to work in a more trauma-informed way. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it, there, there are other trauma-informed groups, I suppose. Um, there is trauma-informed Ireland, I believe, is another group. Um, but our group, um, which is part of the Mental Health Engagement and Recovery Services, is newly established, and we're having great interest from people in actually becoming involved in the group and wanting to add in their troubles worth. Because trauma, like recovery was a couple of years ago, trauma is now, the new, is now becoming a buzzword. Uh, and trauma-informed services is now seen as one potential option to go down. Because a lot of people that have identified their trauma health challenge could have been due to a trauma in past life. And it can be big uh, macro trauma or it can be micro trauma. Um, it could be uh, could be really really tough childhood, or it could be just something that really happened that really resonated with a person, and stuck to a person and made them become unwell in later life. Uh, so it's really really interesting the group that we have. Uh, we've only started working on our objectives, um, our, 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 our on the terms of reference and the objectives sort of group, and we will strive to continue on that work to see is trauma in care. Uh, and trauma-informed services, uh, an option for our Irish services here. Um, I'm now going to pass you on to Martha. And Martha, I have a question for you, if that's okay. Um, and really, um, it, it is, will the role of, of peer supporters, peer others, change in the coming decades, do you think? Um, I would say most definitely, and in ways none of us could probably imagine. But um, I guess I see myself as kind of the product of a bit of affirmative action by the HSC, um, that they wanted to include and involve lived experience. But in my vision anyway, down the road, there would be so much opportunity for even, um, you know, certain disciplines to maybe have an opportunity to reflect on their own lived experience and use that in their practice. Now, we're probably talking decades down the road because I know some disciplines like to keep that objective kind of boundary and there's great reasons for that too but I just think that the variety of lived experience so say I've I've been lucky that I've never actually really felt like the token so to speak but I have been conscious that if I am the only person with lived experience at a at a table um, am I really representative of the massive diversity of lived experience that's possible um, you know that can't be true so yeah, I would like to see more people reflecting on lived experience um, and being, being, being supported to, to do that in their work. Um, so, yeah, I, I can only imagine um, how it's going to develop, but I hope that it will help change the culture 
um, within uh, mental health services so that people will be able to have more open and frank discussions, um, share a little more themselves or respond as human beings rather than, um, uh, you know, staff, because everyone is an individual as well. And I've begun to see myself as a peer to um, other people that I work with, so say nurses, psychologists, occupational therapists, that I'm a peer to them too, in a sense. Um, so that peerness is already starting to, to, to diversify, you know? So um, I think that's an interesting position to be in. I think we're definitely uh, in a situation that's evolving, but I'm, I'm really excited to see where, where it goes. So it was a great question. Thank you, Martha, for that. And it's interesting the way you're kind of after trying to are, 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 are kind of relating to this peerness um, and using uh, and, and really uh, gaining something from having a peer support worker or any kind of peer role on their team. We've only two more questions left in our uh, question and answer session for the World Mental Health Week uh, uh, webinar. Um, and these two questions are open to any member of the panel that are today. Yes, of course. Uh, so how are the forums operating during COVID restrictions? Um, well, from, from uh in our area, we moved straight to Zoom um, and um, it's worked really well. We've had a lot of people, as Virginia said, we've had a lot of people who've come that haven't come before. And we've some people who are regulars that aren't comfortable to come. So there's been quite a change in attendance. But I think overall, the, the numbers are up. Um, the conversations are lively. I think they, um, you know, they're meeting the needs of people during this time of, of COVID. Uh, some of the conversations are getting longer. Some forum meetings are, are, are becoming kind of support chats. And we've we've organized supplementary meetings, uh, you know, to, to cover that sort of social and supportive aspect of people just getting together as opposed to doing sort of forum business for the local um, management teams. Um, that said, uh, not all the areas um, have been allowed to use Zoom. Some, some um, area bosses have been um, very... Um, What's the word compliant with the restrictions that have been placed on Zoom? And I, I, I was lucky that I found a sort of creative way around it uh, that got supported in my area. But other areas were not so, if you like, flexible in their approach. And that's understandable, too. Um, however, it has meant that, that um, I know of some forums that haven't met in some time. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's, that's really unfortunate. And in some instances, area leads um, were redeployed, um, the engagement leads were re redeployed to other parts of the service, you know, to, to deal with the, um, the the human resource requirements, the people requirements of, of dealing with the pandemic and the COVID testing and all the rest of it. Um, and then some of my colleagues around the country uh, were given uh, quite significant additional management duties, uh, which kind of divided their time as well. So, um, I think it's difficult to give a sort of national picture as to how, how engagement has fared. Um, I know that um, I'd say the I know that the majority of areas are doing um, engagement in some form, um, either by phone, by Zoom, um, are using um, a, a program called WebEx. Um, but yeah, I suppose it, it's one of those things where it, it was about the relationship between the individual area lead and the, the, the heads of service and also their relationship with their with the IT support in their region. So there's a very long answer to quite a short question. Sorry. No problem, Charles. And thanks for that. And I think that has really clarified the position of the forms during this COVID-19 pandemic. The final question is for everyone again. Um, so whoever would like to answer this question. And the question is, have local area staff bought into service user, peer support and forums? Yes, Martha. I guess for, for my piece, I would say in um, 
the southeast that staff definitely have that it's been a process a process of education a process of collaboration a process of learning for everybody um but i would say yes um we're now able to engage with uh, people in the acute units um, through the medium of recovery education, but it's kind of a foot in the door, um, which I think is hugely important in a time of COVID when people aren't even getting visitors. So yeah, I could, there's any number of fantastic champions in our region anyway, that I know get peer support and support the idea of peer support. And that gives me a lot of, um, a lot of reassurance and a lot of motivation um, because they have an important role to play as well in in developing it um, and to get their investment is is crucial do you know so yeah for my part i would say that it's definitely it's definitely happening perfect thank you martha for that uh, and it's really interesting you know the whole idea is that some areas have bought into it. Some areas have a, have a have a time to have a bit of time to go before they can buy into it. But we're all trying to move together, and we're all trying to get to a place where people are, are treated for who they are as a person. You know, um, are treated with well, um, and that's initiative service user involvement, peer support, local forums, area forums, all that kind of stuff. So that's all really important as well. Okay, I'd like to thank our panelists uh, for time out to uh, actually answer these questions. Um, uh, and I'd like to thank you, the viewer, uh, for sending in all these questions and, and, and allowing us to have such a rich discussion here today. Um, so I'd like to pass over to Ashley, who's going to close this Q&A session. Thanks, Michael, and thanks to everyone involved today. I really think that anyone watching this will gain something positive. Um, there was such a huge amount of rich discussion, and the panel covered many of the benefits and challenges of greater participation of those with lived experience in our mental health serv services. We want to continue this conversation, so please do seek more information from the Mental Health Engagement and Recovery website and our Twitter page and get in contact with us. Uh, just like Michael said, I'd like to thank our panellists again for their time and their expertise and thanks to those who sent in the questions and we hope to have many more of these uh, webinars in the future. Thank you very much.